In the lawless South, Bonnie and Clyde rose as outlaw legends. Despite their iconic status, though, their story hides dark twists at every corner. Let's dive in and explore the truth behind the glamorized duo's twisted love story and uncover the lesser-known realities of their infamous crime spree. Bonnie and Clyde, both had talents of their own. Before the world of crime came knocking on the duo's doorstep, Clyde was busy discovering his love for music. Turns out he could strum a guitar and belt out tunes on the saxophone like no other. He was really good at playing the guitar and saxophone. Back in the day, Clyde was known for sitting around a campfire playing music and bringing happiness to people going through tough times. And even when they were running from the law, Clyde made sure to bring his saxophone and sheet music with him in the getaway car. Now when it comes to Bonnie, she was a dreamer with big ambitions. She didn't just want to be famous, she wanted to be a superstar. Whether it was wowing crowds on Broadway, belting out tunes as a singer, or stealing the show as an actress, Bonnie had her sights set high. Back in the day, she was a regular star of school plays and pageants, and rumor has it, she once did a cartwheel on stage just to steal back the spotlight. Looking back, it's wild to think that Bonnie and Clyde could have been famous for their talents instead of their law-breaking ways. However, another wild aspect in both of these lives comes from the relationship Bonnie and Clyde had. Many people thought these two were in love with each other from the beginning. The truth was far from it, though. Bonnie was married, and the man wasn't Clyde. Bonnie's heart belonged to another man long before she crossed paths with Clyde. This man was Roy Thornton, the forgotten piece of Bonnie's romantic puzzle. Bonnie and Roy's love story started way back in 1926 when they tied the knot. According to the Texas History Notebook, Roy was described as a real looker. He wasn't just your average Joe, either. The guy had a knack for trouble, and that made him the perfect match for Bonnie's rebellious spirit. They met when Bonnie was just a teenager, and despite her tender age, she made the bold decision to drop out of school and get hitched to Roy. This is where things get really messy, though. Roy had a wandering eye. He'd vanish for ages, dabble in crime, and cozy up to other women while Bonnie held down the fort. Bonnie wasn't blind to his antics, either. She poured her heart out in her diary where she talked about her roaming husband with a roaming mind. After enduring his disappearing acts one too many times, Bonnie had had enough. She declared she was done with men. As fate would have it, Roy's story ended just four years after Bonnie's tragic demise. It was cut short by a prison break gone wrong. Indeed, in the world of prison, anybody would want to get out as soon as possible. This was true for Clyde when he was arrested for quite some time and locked away in dangerous chambers. Clyde suffered incredibly in prison. Before all the big heists and wild chases, Clyde's run-ins with the law were pretty tame. His rap sheet included things like forgetting to return a rental car on time and swiping a turkey. Then his situation took a sharp turn when Clyde, at just 21, landed himself in the slammer for burglary. The place he ended up was Eastham Prison Farm, and it was like something out of a nightmare. Texas Monthly paints it as the ultimate in prison horror stories, a place where beatings from guards were as common as dirt and violence was just part of daily life. There was one inmate, Big Ed Crowder, who made Clyde's life absolutely miserable with beatings and by taking advantage of him. However, Clyde wasn't one to take it lying down. One night, pushed to his limit, he snapped and took matters into his own hands. Let's just say Big Ed didn't walk away from that encounter. The crazy part about this incident, though, is that Clyde got away with it. Another inmate took the fall, and Clyde walked out of there a changed man. Prison had toughened him up big time. He went from being a wide-eyed kid to a stone-cold survivor. An interesting thing here is that, even before he left, Clyde was already plotting his revenge. He had this grand scheme to gather a crew, snatch up cash and guns, and then come back to Eastham to settle the score with the guards who made his life extremely difficult. However, it wasn't just Clyde who suffered massively. Prison had also taken a toll on Bonnie. You see, while Clyde was the one with the hardened criminal reputation, Bonnie was right there alongside Clyde, living life on the edge. Sadly, that lifestyle eventually caught up with her. In March 1932, Bonnie found herself smack dab in the middle of what the public broadcasting service calls a botched robbery. Clyde was able to escape from the scene, but Bonnie wasn't so lucky. The long arm of the law caught up with her and landed her in a Texas jail until her case could go before a grand jury. Bonnie's time behind bars wasn't anything like Clyde's horror show of hard labor and brutality. Make no mistake, though, those months locked away still left their mark on her. While she was doing time, Bonnie did something unexpected. She wrote poetry. Bonnie poured her heart and soul into those verses, and much of them were about her. 
Her poems weren't just about roses and rainbows, though. They were also a window into her loyalty to Clyde, plain and simple. When Bonnie's mom got wind of her poetic pursuits, let's just say she wasn't thrilled. She saw a strange and terrifying change in her daughter's mind. Nobody blamed her for thinking that either. After all, Bonnie's words hinted at a deep devotion to Clyde, even if you could read between the lines and see that she might have been holding him responsible for landing her behind bars. Fast forward to June, and the grand jury had a tough call to make. Turns out they decided she must have been under some kind of pressure. This is because the court ended up giving her a pass, saying she couldn't have been a willing participant in Clyde's escapades. However, within weeks of walking out of those jailhouse doors, she was right back by Clyde's side and ready to dive headfirst into their life of crime once again. Now, Bonnie may have written poetry over her devotion to Clyde, but those prose can also lead you to the way she used to think. Bonnie's poetry reveals a lot about her mind. Take the story of Suicide Sal, for example. Penned behind bars in 1932, this poem reads like a cautionary tale straight out of Bonnie's own life. It's about a girl named Sal who falls head over heels for a smooth-talking professional K asterisk Eller. Together, they dive into the seedy world of crime, just like Bonnie and Clyde. But things take a dark turn when Sal ends up behind bars, while her partner skips off into the sunset. Sounds like a case of art imitating life? You bet. Then there's the one everyone knows, the story of Bonnie and Clyde. Penned in 1934, this poem is like Bonnie's own personal manifesto. In it, she compares herself and Clyde to legendary outlaws like Jesse James and paints their duo as victims of an unjust system. Bonnie doesn't just romanticize their life on the run, she straight up predicts their tragic end too. If you think about it, these poems aren't just words on a page. They're a testament to her undying love for Clyde. They're also a reflection of her unwavering determination to live life on her own terms, no matter the cost. Indeed, Bonnie was always able to muster great strength in any situation she was put in. Not only she, but even Clyde had suffered through a lot. Together, both of these people had faced so much violence in their lives that there also had been permanent implications on their physical health. The duo had suffered great damage to their legs. You wouldn't think it, but both Bonnie and Clyde had their fair share of trouble putting one foot in front of the other by the time their infamous journey came to an end. Let's start with Clyde. After enduring the horrors of Eastham Prison, Clyde found himself desperate for a way out. So desperate, in fact, that he took matters into his own hands, quite literally. In a bid to avoid the backbreaking labor and secure a transfer, Clyde convinced another inmate to part his foot from his body with the help of an axe, and we're not talking about a little toe here. This gruesome act left Clyde with a lasting limp, forcing him to drive barefoot from then on. Sadly, though, his sacrifice was all for naught. The parole board had already greenlit his release before he took the axe to his toes. Now, on to Bonnie. In June 1933, the pair found themselves in a nasty car crash. Bonnie was doused in battery acid, leaving her right leg severely burned and even eating away at the bone in some spots. It was a gruesome injury, one that should have sent her straight to the nearest hospital, of course. That wasn't an option for the notorious outlaw duo. Instead, Bonnie was left to suffer, nursed by Clyde and their gangmates. Alas, their makeshift medical care wasn't enough to save Bonnie's ability to walk properly. From that day forward, she'd never walk the same again. Ultimately, of all the things that Bonnie and Clyde had gone through, what ended up making them famous for the first time was something truly bizarre. Bonnie and Clyde's fame came after some pictures of them went viral. At the time when Bonnie and Clyde were being shown fresh on the news for their crimes, they had become very famous. For two years, the public couldn't get enough of their escapades. What turned this young, rebellious couple into household names, though, wasn't just their daring crimes. It was a series of misleading photographs that captured the public's imagination. You see, Bonnie and Clyde's fame skyrocketed when some rolls of undeveloped film were discovered by the police during a raid on one of their safe houses. These innocent snapshots of the couple goofing around might have gone unnoticed, but once they hit the newspapers, they became front-page news. Thanks to the wonders of modern technology, these images were soon transmitted far and wide and turned Bonnie and Clyde into overnight celebrities. The public ate it up. These photos showed Bonnie and Clyde in moments of playful intimacy and painted them as star-crossed lovers rather than dangerous criminals. There was Bonnie, pretending to take aim at Clyde. There she was, perched on his shoulders, laughing like carefree youths in love. Perhaps the most iconic image of all was Bonnie with a cigar between her teeth and a pistol in her hand. In that moment, 
she was exuding confidence and defiance in equal measure. It was the perfect image of the gun-wielding mall and looked like it came straight out of a Hollywood movie. The truth is, despite the public's fascination with these images, they didn't always reflect reality. Sure, Bonnie had a flair for drama, but she wasn't exactly a sharpshooter, and she preferred cigarettes to cigars. None of that mattered, though. Thanks to these misleading pictures, Bonnie and Clyde went from small-time outlaws to criminal superstars. It seemed like Bonnie had finally achieved the fame she'd always dreamed of. With fame, though, comes a whole line of misconstrued information that is far from the truth. One of the false things the duo became famous for was ending the lives of many, many people. Ultimately, that wasn't the case. Truth is, Bonnie and Clyde didn't take many lives. The Barrow Gang's criminal adventures in rural Texas are like a confusing puzzle. It's hard to tell what's true and what's not, but one thing's clear. They caused a lot of trouble. When it comes to how many people they slayed, it's hard to say for sure. Estimates put it around a dozen, more or less. Most of their victims were law enforcement officers. Whenever Bonnie and Clyde were in trouble, gunshots rang out, and cops ended up getting hurt. Take the Joplin Raid, for example. In the chaos of that shootout, a farmer-turned-part-time cop named John Harriman met his maker, while his buddy Harry McGinnis, who sustained bullet wounds to his arm. Now, as for Bonnie's role in all this bloodshed, it's a bit of a gray area, but here's one story that's got folks talking. The tale of Bonnie treating a patrolman's body with no dignity after taking his life as he lay helpless on the ground. That is definitely a chilling act right there. No doubt these stories paint a dark picture of the Barrow Gang's wild ride through the heart of Texas. Amidst all this bloodshed, though, there was also one murder that Clyde ended up walking freely away from. Clyde was declared innocent in one murder by historians. There was one incident that had folks pointing fingers at Clyde Barrow. In 1932, the little grocery store in Sherman, Texas got hit in a robbery gone wrong. An employee named Howard Hall met an untimely end and the whole town was convinced the notorious duo was behind it. To be fair, they were the talk of the town back then, so it's no surprise the papers ran with it. Here's where things get interesting. Later in the 90s, local historians started digging into the case. Armed with official records and a whole lot of determination, they set out to uncover the truth. What they found is nothing short of shocking. Turns out, Bonnie and Clyde weren't anywhere near Sherman when the robbery went down. In fact, they might have been closer to Michigan than Texas at the time. So, what does this mean? Well, for starters, it clears Clyde's name for this particular crime. Sure, we can never be 100% certain, but the evidence points to one thing. Clyde Barrow probably wasn't the one who took Howard Hall's life. That was one thing Clyde never should have been held accountable for, let alone become famous over. However, even in the things the duo did become famous over, it turns out they weren't as big as everybody thought they were. The duo's infamous robberies weren't actually that impressive. Sure, Bonnie and Clyde had a knack for stealing nice cars and looked dapper in those fancy clothes, but here's the thing. Their robberies weren't exactly the stuff of legend. Contrary to popular belief, these outlaw lovebirds weren't living large. In fact, they were barely scraping by, living hand-to-mouth with their gang. Despite their daring heists, they rarely made off with more than a few hundred bucks, and sometimes they'd hit a real jackpot, a whopping $8.00. On top of this, during the 21 months when the duo was committing crimes, they only managed to hit fewer than 15 banks. Plus, the Great Depression had marked a big shift in people's lives, including Bonnie and Clyde's. In that new world, after so much chaos had consumed the people around them, the duo's schemes didn't always go as planned. Consider the time they tried to hit the Ponder State Bank in Texas only to find out it had already gone bust a week earlier. Clyde's mother let him do whatever he wanted. When the dust settled after Bonnie and Clyde's demise, the U.S. government wasn't just going after the outlaws. They had their sights set on their families, too. In the eyes of the prosecutor, Cumey was the real mastermind behind the scenes. It looked like Cumey was knee-deep in Clyde's mess from the get-go. When Clyde found himself in a tight spot, Cumey didn't hesitate to pull out all the stops. When he was facing murder charges, she spun a web of lies in a newspaper interview, swearing he was with her miles away from the crime scene. She even shaved a few years off his age to make him seem like an innocent kid caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, Cumey's support didn't stop there. She welcomed Bonnie and Clyde with open arms and showered them with affection. When the heat was on her, though, she wasn't afraid to shed a few tears and plead ignorance to save her own skin. You know what? It worked. 
While others faced harsh sentences, Kumi managed to wriggle her way into just a month behind bars. No one knows why Kumi didn't call her son out for the violent acts he committed from the very beginning. What's certain is that even Bonnie was more attracted to Clyde because of his criminal pursuit. Today, there's an explanation that sheds some light on why women like Bonnie let men get away with things. The Bonnie and Clyde Syndrome Bonnie and Clyde might have been partners in crime, but they were anything but equals when it came to violence. While Clyde was out there brandishing guns and robbing banks, Bonnie was often chilling in the getaway car and steering clear of the action. Eyewitnesses swear she never pulled the trigger herself and leaned more towards kidnapping over murder. Apart from that, even before diving headfirst into a life of crime, Bonnie was known for her kindness and generosity. So what drew her to a bad boy like Clyde? Well, psychologists have a term for it. Hybristophilia. It's a mouthful, but basically, it's when someone gets a thrill from being involved with a partner who's done some incredibly violent acts, such as taking lives or armed robberies. Let's face it, Clyde fit the bill perfectly. However, even though Clyde was considered one of the biggest criminal masterminds ever to exist, there was still a time when he thought about taking the right path. Clyde did consider going straight. Believe it or not, Clyde Barrow, the man behind the outlaw legend, once entertained the idea of leaving his life of crime behind. After his stint at Eastham Prison, he gave it a shot. He worked at his folks' gas station and even looked for a job up in Massachusetts. But as luck would have it, he found himself drawn back into the thieving game. Clyde wasn't the only one in the family with hopes of turning things around, though. Buck Barrow, Clyde's brother, got released from prison in 33, sparking a glimmer of hope. The family thought maybe Buck could talk some sense into Clyde and convince him to call it quits. So they all gathered in Joplin, Missouri, hoping for a heart-to-heart. -heart. Everything got a bit complicated at this point. A haphazard get-together turned into a chaotic shootout with the cops. And tragically, Buck didn't make it. Not long after, Bonnie's mom, Emma Parker, decided to try talking some sense into her daughter. She begged Bonnie to turn herself in. Promises were made that she'd only face prison time, not the death penalty, but Bonnie, stubborn as ever, brushed off her mom's plea. Many people now think Bonnie wasn't willing to listen to reason because she was also surrounded by other violent people apart from Clyde. What was later found was that many of them were part of the Barrow Gang. Who was the Barrow Gang? When you hear about Bonnie and Clyde, you often hear about their gang. But truth be told, it wasn't exactly a well-organized criminal enterprise. According to Heart of Texas Tales, it was more like a loose collection of individuals, often committing crimes in small groups rather than as one big crew. While Bonnie Parker was a constant presence, other members came and went over time, with only a handful of regulars. Now, let's take a look at the diverse cast of characters that made up the Barrow Gang and their fates. Buck Barrow, Clyde's brother and husband to Blanche, met a tragic end. He succumbed to pneumonia after surgery. Despite surviving numerous shootouts with the law, his wounds ultimately caught up with him. Blanche herself served six years in prison and lived on until 1988. Raymond Hamilton, a notorious figure, held the title of public enemy number one from 1934 to 1935. Despite being sentenced to a staggering 362 years behind bars, he eventually faced the death penalty. W.D. Jones, another member of the gang, was caught and sentenced to 15 years, though he only served six. In a surprising turn of events, he later spilled the beans about his time with Bonnie and Clyde in a 1968 interview with Playboy. Unfortunately, his life ended in tragedy when he was shot during a violent altercation in 1974. The last survivor of the gang, Ralph Fultz, had a rough start to life, diving into crime at just 14 years old. After spending nine years behind bars, he managed to turn his life around. He passed away from cancer in 1993 at the age of 82. Along with these individuals, though, there was another loyal companion of the gang. However, he was far from human. The gang had a faithful dog called Snowball. Perhaps the weirdest part of Bonnie and Kyde's entire life story is their connection to their trusty dog, Snowball. As the story goes, Buck Barrow teamed up with his brother Clyde in Joplin, Missouri. As Blanche Barrow recounts in her book, My Life with Bonnie and Clyde, little did Snowball, their four-legged friend, know that he was about to embark on quite the adventure. According to Blanche's tale, 
Snowball was excited about the car ride to Joplin. Once they settled in, the gang passed the time with some low-key mischief, while Blanche and Snowball kept each other entertained. Texas Monthly even mentions Blanche's card games and playful antics with her furry companion during her downtime. But Snowball's loyalty to his human pals would lead to a heart-wrenching twist. When chaos erupted during a police raid on their hideout, Blanche made a run for it. As she was whisked away into the getaway car, though, poor Snowball was left behind. Later, Blanche included a snapshot of herself and Snowball in a letter to her father reminiscing about their time together. The inscription on the back revealed her affection for her lost companion. The number of people and beings that played a part in Bonnie Clyde's lifelong story doesn't just end here. One important person who ends up spending time with the couple also ends up embalming them. The couple had met the person who soon embalmed them. Bonnie and Clyde weren't naive about their fate. They knew the end game all too well. If they surrendered, it meant capital punishment. If they got caught, it meant their lives could potentially end at that moment. So they stuck to their guns, quite literally, continuing their crime spree and waiting for the inevitable violent showdown. In one daring heist back in 33, they tried to swipe a swanky new Ford. This time, however, the owner, H. Dillard Darby, wasn't about to let them off easy. He hopped into another car with a friend and chased them down. Then, Things took a bizarre turn when Bonnie and Clyde turned the tables, kidnapping the duo. Surprisingly, Bonnie intervened by saving their lives and showing a glimmer of mercy. As they cruised around with their captive audience, Bonnie discovered Darby's profession. He was an undertaker. Ever the Joker, she quipped about him working on their corpses someday. Little did she know that joke would hit closer to home than anyone could have imagined. Less than a year later, Darby found himself embalming Bonnie and Clyde's remains. It wasn't an easy task. Vintage News reveals that the Undertakers struggled to embalm them. Due to the nature of the bullet wounds Bonnie and Clyde had suffered, it was getting extremely difficult to use the fluids required during the process. To understand why both of them sustained bullet wounds, it's important to look at how they met their eventual end. The Violent Demise of Bonnie and Clyde Bonnie and Clyde knew deep down that their days were numbered. On that fateful day, May 23, 1934, in Black Lake, Louisiana, the inevitable showdown unfolded in a blaze of gunfire. It all began to unravel when a Federal Bureau of Investigation agent caught wind of Bonnie and Clyde's frequent visits to the area, particularly the home of their accomplice, Henry Methvin. However, it was a crucial tip-off in May that finally sealed their fate. Learning of their planned return for a party, law enforcement from Louisiana and Texas collaborated to lay a deadly trap along the roadside. Among those poised for the ambush was Deputy Ted Hinton, who had a unique connection to Bonnie from their days in Dallas. This is the place where she worked as a waitress. In his later book, Ambush, Hinton admitted to harboring a soft spot for Bonnie. As Bonnie and Clyde's car approached the hidden lawman that morning, it became a scene of chaos as over 160 bullets rained down upon them. Their end was swift and final. Bonnie was found clutching a sandwich, cigarettes, and a machine gun, while Clyde held onto a revolver. It was a violent end to their notorious criminal saga and cemented their place in history as the ultimate outlaw duo. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.